Uh, please be seated. A very challenging song to sing before we open God's Word. Whate'er my God ordains is right. The verse that our brother, Pastor Manasseh, started our service with, our God is good and does good. Teach me your statutes. You ready? We're going to turn to the book of Numbers again, this time to Numbers chapter 10. If you'll join me there, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. You're going to see why this is very challenging. As we look into God's word this morning, I want to look at a particular topic. So we're going to jump a little bit to see instances of it. So Numbers chapter 10, let's read verses 11 to 13. Numbers chapter 10, verses 11 to 13. This is the word of God. In the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai. And the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. They set out for the first time at the command of the Lord by Moses. Come with me now to verse 29 of that same chapter. Chapter 10, verse 29. And Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we're setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you. For the Lord has promised good to Israel. But he said to them, I will not go. I will depart to my own land and to mine kindred. And he said, please do not leave us, for you know where we should camp in the wilderness and you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same we do to you. So they set out from the mount of the Lord, three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them, three days' journey to set out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day, whenever they set out from the camp. Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. Over into chapter 11, verse 1. And the people complained. There it is. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So the name of that place was called Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now, the manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance like that of delium. The people went about and gathered it and ground it in hand mills or beat it in mortars and boiled it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. When the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell with it. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Come with me, please, now in that same chapter to verse 31. Chapter 11, verse 31. 
Then a wind from the Lord sprang up, and it brought quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp. About a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side around the camp, and about two cubits above the ground. And the people rose all that day and all night and all the next day and gathered the quail. Those who gathered, least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. Therefore, the name of that place was called Kibroth Hata'ava, because there they buried people who had the craving. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are good and you do good. Teach us your statutes. Whatever our God ordains is right. Help us indeed to hear the warning of your word that we might not grumble as those ancient Israelites did. And we pray this for your name's sake. Amen. Now, let me tell you a little bit about where I grew up. I grew up in the United Kingdom, in Northern Ireland. Now, in Northern Ireland, let's just say we grumbled and complained so much about different things that it's kind of like a national sport, okay? We would grumble about the weather, always grumbled about the weather. We would grumble about the politics, We would grumble about the price of gas or petrol, as we would call it back there. We would grumble about the price of groceries. And if you were a Christian, oh my goodness, you had a whole new set of stuff that you got to grumble about. You got to grumble about the music. You got to grumble about what the pastor was wearing or not wearing. Sorry, no jacket today, folks. You got to grumble about all the good old days. Well, this is how we used to do it. We never used to do it that way. Now, as I look out, I'm I'm hearing giggles. I'm seeing smiles on faces. Do you mean to tell me that you all in Canada here as well, you grumble and complain about things too? Really? Well, what do you know? Well, what do you know? Maybe, just maybe... Grumbling and complaining is just a little bit broader than just what it is in Northern Ireland and in the UK. It is a kind of a contagious disease of sorts, isn't it? It really is. It, but this isn't just a modern day problem. As we look at our passages this morning, we see it again. We heard it. But truth be told, We hardly bother about our complaining and our grumbling, don't we? It's just a kind of a way of life for many of us. Let me ask you, have you ever heard somebody in your small group say, you really, you know what I'd love for you to pray for? I would love you to pray about my complaining, please. Have you ever heard that? No, neither have I. Have you ever heard of Grumblers Anonymous? No, neither have I. If it's seen as a sin at all, it's actually seen as one of those respectable sins. No, I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being objective, we say to ourselves. We try to excuse it. We'll shrug our shoulders and say, well, everybody grumbles. It's just what it means to be human, isn't it? But the Apostle Paul, speaking with uh, the, this passage in mind in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 10 and 11, he says, no. He says, no, do not grumble. It can be deadly. The Apostle Paul refers to our passage today in the book of 1 Corinthians. No, do not grumble. It can be deadly, our brother Paul says. So we're going to look at this section in Numbers, three units as we follow the story through, and then we'll apply three quick lessons at the end. 
Book of Numbers again begins at Mount Sinai. The people of Israel have been there for a year. They've received the law of God, and they're about to set out on their journey to the promised land, but before they go, there's lots of preparations. (coughs) The first nine chapters of the book are all about the preparation, and then finally, chapter 10, they set out. So firstly, we see a promising start, a promising start. Chapter 10, verse 11 In the second year, the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai. The tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was right at the very heart of the camp. The cloud hovering above it is a reminder that God is really there. He's really with them. The end of chapter 9, the instructions, well, they were really clear. When the cloud starts moving, they pick up and they start moving too. When the cloud stops, they're to stop and they're to camp. So they set out. And as we read in the verses at the end of chapter 10, it is clear that God is right at the center of life and vision of the people of Israel. This is a wandering pilgrim people as they were meant to be, as we're meant to be too as we are pilgrims through this world. Because we've seen again and again, if we belong to the Lord Jesus, we too have been redeemed from slavery and we're sent on a journey which is to the penultimate promised land, heaven, the new creation which is yet to come. We journey too with God at the very center. Well, what makes this a promising start? Well, firstly, they obey God's orders, His commands. Verse 13, they set out for the first time at the command of the Lord by Moses. They trust God's promises. There's this lovely wee conversation between Moses and his father-in-law who isn't an Israelite. And he says, we're setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I'll give it to you. Come with us. Come with us. And I believe that that's what we should all be doing as Christians. We're on a journey, yes, our eyes are set on that promised land yet to come, and we should be inviting others to come with us. Come with us. And if you're someone for whom things are new with regards to the Christian faith, and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian yet this morning, it's what we're saying to you today. Come with us. Or at the very least, stick with us for a bit, investigate, ask good questions to figure out why we are living this Jesus-centered life. Verse 30, but he, Hobab, said to him, I will not go, I will depart to my own land and to my kindred. And that's the choice that every one of us has. Some folks say, no, this is my world, I'm going to stick with this home. But verse 31, Moses pleads with him, please do not leave us, for you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same will be done to you. There's a wonderful trust there that Moses has. So obey God's orders, but also he's trusting in God's promises. And then we see also He depends on God's protection. So obey God's orders, trusting God's promises, and then depending on God's protection. And you see it at the end of the chapter, verse 35. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And we've seen, haven't we, that the people of God are not only wandering, they're also engaged in warfare. We saw that all the way back at the beginning of our time in this book. And that too is true of the people of God. As we're pilgrims, there are enemies around the world, the flesh and the devil in this modern world. And Moses depends on the Lord, not on his own resources. And this is a prayer. Lord, fight for us. Rise up, O Lord. Fight for us. 
And when the cloud comes to rest, they camp. There's a recognition that they need the Lord with them, looking after them over the night. Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. So it's a really promising start with God at the very center of the life and vision of Israel. But it doesn't continue like that, does it? So secondly, we see a rapid decline, a rapid decline. How long does it take? Three days. That's it. Just three days. Chapter 11, verse 1, and the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes, and when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. Well, it's a parent's nightmare, isn't it? The money is saved, the bookings are made, the preparations all come together for a holiday. There's much excitement in the preparation, but the traveling, not so much. And we're 20 minutes into the traveling, and it starts, doesn't it? Is it much further? He's breathing my air. He's touching me. I'm hungry, she says. You know the drill. I need the bathroom. You know the drill. And the grumbling continues, and what turns out to might be a three, four-hour drive might feel like three to four years. For the Israelites, it was three days, and they're whinging and whining already. And those opening three verses of chapter 11 give a pattern that is repeated again and again and again in these upcoming chapters of the rest of the book. The people turn from the Lord. In this case, they're grumbling. The Lord is angry. He judges them, in this case, with fire coming on the outskirts of the camp. And then Moses prays. He's the mediator who intercedes for them. And the Lord, in His grace, relents. And you'd think that they'd learn their lesson wouldn't you? But no. Verse 4, now the rabble, the only place that word appears in the Old Testament, the rabble, that was among them at a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. They hadn't learned the lesson. And as you follow through these next 10, 11 chapters or so, we have one episode after another where the people sin. They don't trust the Lord, sometimes grumbling in this way, sometimes other sins. The Lord is angry with them. Moses prays, grace delivers them, but they still don't learn the lesson. It comes again and again and again. And too often, we're like that on our journey to the promised land. This is a disease, grumbling, that spreads so quickly. Notice it begins with the rabble. My commentators tell us that these are non-Israelites. The book of Exodus tells us that there were a number of others, maybe Egyptians, who came along with them as they left in, in the Exodus. They were the hangers-on, if you like. And later it seems that they're integrated into Israel, but they're still kind of on the fringe of things. But the grumbling doesn't stay there. And it spreads quickly to the Israelites. Verse 10, Moses heard the people weeping through their clans, everyone at the door of his or her tent. It's a super spreader event. That's what's going on. It's a super spreader event. Everybody's getting in on it. Maybe you've seen it in your school or your college, your place of work, in your family, or even here at church. It starts with one or two complaining about a teacher or a principal or a pastor or if at work then the boss man, the boss lady, whomever. Then it becomes a bit of a habit. At first, it's all a bit of a joke. We all join in and we go, ha, 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 how witty but then it infects the whole spirit and everybody's at it. And then there's an edge that comes with it too. As Christians, we are to be different, aren't we? But actually, as the grumbling continued, it then affected the people of God, every one of them. And how spiritually damaging it can be. This is a serious disease. Spiritually speaking, this is not the equivalent 
of the common cold. It's a heart disease. That's what we learned. You see, in chapter 10, their hearts are focused on the Lord. They're obeying Him. They're trusting in His promises. They're depending on Him. But as they whine and they whinge, they don't do so to the Lord. In this feeble, angry kind of prayer, there's no mention of God. They're totally focused on their circumstances. Their hearts have been turned from Him. And God says as much, verse 20, you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before Him saying, why did you come out? Why did we come out of Egypt? <clears throat> the Israelites have started to lose their spiritual moorings. They're not seeing as clearly spiritually speaking as they once did. This heart disease of grumbling, it distorts things. Verse 5 of chapter 11, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. Ah, yes, the good old days back in lovely Egypt. All that gorgeous food that we enjoyed. You'd almost think that they've been to some type of holiday camp. But they'd been slaves. Remember that? It had been horrific. Remember that? Slave labor, no pay, desperate to escape, and now the Lord has graciously redeemed them, and they look back with these rose-tinted glasses, and they forget the chains. They just think of cucumbers. Grumbling has affected their view of the past, these rose-tinted spectacles, and how easy it is for us too. For those of us who have been rescued from slavery to sin, redeemed from an empty way of life by the precious blood of Christ, to forget the slavery that we had to sin. We so easily forget that we were trapped, separated from God without a hope in the world, and we focus on things that we think we're missing out on. And the reality is we can still enjoy the good things of life. In fact, we can enjoy, enjoy them more as we see them as gifts from our loving Heavenly Father. These good gifts come down from Him, from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. But we look around and we're jealous of those who don't have a God that they seek to obey. They're just free to do whatever they like, ignoring the fact that sin never pays. Rose-tinted glasses looking at the past. But those same glasses are not just rose-tinted, they're also gray-tinted when it comes to looking at the present. Gray. This grumbling prevents them from seeing anything good. You ever met somebody like that? Ugh. They're entirely focused on bad things. <clears throat> Verse 6, but now our strength is dried up and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. It's very similar to Exodus 16 before they get to Sinai. They were grumbling then because of a lack of food. God graciously answers their prayer, provides them with this wonderful gift of manna. But they quickly take it for granted. <laughs> How much is this like us? How much is this like us? And now they're no longer grumbling because of a lack of food. They're grumbling because of a lack of variety. Oh, no, not manna again. What's for breakfast? Manna. Lunch? Manna. Dinner? Manna. I think I'd like a snack. We got some manna. And we might feel some sympathy for it, for them. But get, it, get out of your minds that this stuff was like a, a kind of a, a, a dry morsel of tasteless bread. Get that out of your mind. Verse 7, now the manna was like coriander seed. That's tasty. And its appearance like that of bdellium, or another translation says resin. 
And that is a highly prized substance, delium, and it appears alongside gold in the Garden of Eden all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. Verse 8 tells us that it's very versatile as well. The people went about, gathered it, and ground it into hand mills, beat it in mortars, boiled it in pots, made cakes of it, and the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. You get to eat cake all day long. Huh. Sounds pretty good to me. There were all sorts of things you could do with it, and it was delicious is the point that he's trying to make. One of the Psalms actually refers to it as the bread of heaven. But they've stopped thanking God for it. Their vision is entirely focused on what they don't have and how easily that happens to us as well. I don't know what it might be for you. Maybe there's some aspect of your life that it isn't as it should be, or you, what you think it should be. Maybe you're sad about some aspect of your upbringing that dominates your vision. We, we can't get over it. Or someone has done something to you, and you can't let it go. Someone said something to you, or you think, well, I've plotted out my life. Surely by now I was going to be married. I was going to have kids. Surely I was going to have gone this far at my work. But now I've been passed over twice. It's not, not going to probably happen. Or I assumed that I was going to get those grades, but didn't. And now the life that I've mapped out for myself, college or university or job, it's, it's just not happening. It, it dominates my vision. And so often that leads to a resentment, a, a sourness, and we cease to see the good things that God has given us. Folks, count your blessings, name them one by one. We got a song for it. It is a wonderful thing to do because when you stop to think of all the good things that God has done and given, life starts to just look different, doesn't it? It starts to look different even in the midst of great heartache. We've been focusing on all the things that we've been missing out on, and then we focus on all the things that God has given us, including us being forced to miss out on certain things. Perhaps we've been so focused on the deprivations that we haven't seen the good things that still apply. We're still redeemed. We're still loved by God. We still know Him as our Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit is walking with us every step of the way. Then there's the church family that cares for us and loves us. Too often we can be so focused on the people who we want to care for us, but they really don't know us that much and they don't care enough for us. <clears throat> they should have understood sometimes people think of what I was going through. They should have said this or that. They should have done the other. And we're so focused on what people aren't doing for us that we fail to remember all the many things that God is giving us through His people. Now, this is not to say that we should never acknowledge that things are hard. For many of us, things are hard, very hard. And it's not grumbling that when asked how things are going, you acknowledge that things are hard. It's not grumbling to tell God that this is really hard. And there are plenty of examples of that in the Psalms and the rest of the Bible where people are being very honest, they're being very raw with God. That's turning to God, that's turning into the light with these things rather than doing what the Israelites do, were doing and turning away from God and into the darkness. God's out of the picture altogether. There's no mention of the good things that God has promised that Moses was so focused on in chapter 10. They forget the reason why they're going through these hardships. They're on a journey to the promised land. Don't expect the com comforts of heaven while you're on the road. A promising start, a rapid decline, and then thirdly, a mixed response. A mixed response. Really, from verse 10 onwards, the focus of chapter 11 is on the response. It's summarized in verse 10. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. The anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. 
the Lord was angry. Of course he was. After all that he had done for them. And Moses was displeased. And that's a bit of an understatement as you read the verses that follow. I mean, he's really fed up. His job as a leader has become miserable. Just imagine being a boss at work. The whole workforce has been infected by grumbling. Maybe that's been your experience. And here is the human leader of the people of God, two million or so, and they're all grumbling, every single one of them. And so verse 11, Moses said to the Lord, why have you dealt ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you laid the burden of all this people on me? Verse 14, I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. And we've talked about the contagion of grumbling. Well, here, it kind of seems to have infected Moses as well. It's striking that in chapter 10, all the focus is on God. But here in his little speech from verses 11 to 15, it's all I, I, me, me. There's a bit of grumbling going on, but at least he's turning to God. He hasn't turned away from him. He's still saying, God, I need you. And God graciously responds. He raises up 70 elders, our passage says, who receive the Spirit of God and who are equipped to work alongside Moses in leading the people. And God also answers the requests of the people. He gives them the meat that they craved. Ho, ho, ho. And so, verse 18, Therefore the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat it. You shall not eat just one day or 20 days, but a whole month until it comes out your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? Now, this is one of those instances in the Bible where it is hard to work out if this is a mercy or if this is a judgment. He gives them what they want, and they're going to be sick of it. And so I say to you, my brothers and sisters, be careful what you wish for, because the Lord just might give it to you. Of course, it can be right and proper to long for lots of different things. God has made us to live on food and drink, to enjoy relationships, many, many good things. But if we allow our hearts to be taken over by craving something other than God, it will eat us up. It will never satisfy. I want to warn you. Before you get eaten up by what you long to feed you, recognize that nothing but the Lord Jesus will ultimately satisfy your soul. Nothing. Nothing other than Him. Well, God does what He promises. There's a vast flock that comes, far more than they could ever eat. But verse 33, right at the end of the chapter, while the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, whilst they were still gnawing on it, chewing down on it, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. It's a deadly disease. And the Apostle Paul says, looking back at this instance from Numbers in 1 Corinthians 10, do not grumble as some of them did and were destroyed. So how are we going to resist this attitude, this mindset from overtaking our hearts? Well, three quick lessons, three quick lessons. Number one, keep turning to the Lord. Keep turning to the Lord. Always turn to the Lord. Remember when they turned away from Him, they saw everything differently and grumbling took over. Brothers and sisters, we have to make sure that we're not turning to darkness, but that we're turning to the Lord and to the light so that we can see things as we should. I'm not talking about a blindness. It's not a pretending that everything is wonderful. We're on a journey. We're not home yet. 
It's more than fine to acknowledge I'm finding this really hard. But if we turn to the Lord, we won't just acknowledge some of the hard things. We will also see good things. We'll remember his redemption. We'll remember the wonder of his his salvation. We'll remember who we now are in Christ. We'll remember that we're not alone. He's given us his people. He's given us his spirit to travel with us. We will keep turning to the Lord. Secondly, keep looking to the future. Keep looking to the future. Don't expect all the comforts of home yet. We're on a journey. Keep looking to the future. Of course, there will be lack and hardships along the way. In 1939, the British Expeditionary Force was trapped at Dunkirk in France. Perhaps you've seen the movie Dunkirk. Their evacuation was pretty miraculous. The German forces were all around them. Airs, uh, air uh, planes coming down upon them, shooting at them, dropping bombs. But as they looked up and out to the channel, over to where home was, they started to see a massive flotilla of boats of all kinds coming to pick them up. They could see what was happening in the future. And as one person said, any ship, any ship was home. Any ship, any ship was home. They weren't squabbling about who was going to get into the nicer ships. They weren't thinking about that at all. It was all about survival. It was any ship was home. And they were on their way back to friends and family and old blighty. There were no complaints. Let us not lose our perspective too. There is much yet to come. Keep turning to the Lord. Keep looking to, the, looking to the future. And then finally, keep trusting in the Savior. Keep trusting in the Savior. Moses at this time was the mediator. He prayed to the Lord for all the people. And in answer to Moses' prayers in these chapters, God relents. But Moses is an imperfect Mediator. We see it here. He's hardly praying for uh, the people. He's praying, but his, this prayer of his is more self centered. I, I, me, me. He's been infected by this disease himself, but praise God, we have the perfect mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who never grumbled. And when he faces the ungrateful, whinging, whining, grumbling of his people, Let's face it, we've all done a bit of that from time to time. The Lord Jesus does not react as Moses did. He says, Father, he says, I love them. I'm going to die for them. He doesn't say as Moses said, Father, I've had it with these people. I'd rather die than have to do anything, have anything to do with them. No, no. It's, I love them. I'm going to die for them. And the plague that should have hit us for our grumbling, God's judgment, On the cross, it hits him, and he protects us from what we deserve to face for our turning away from God. Will you look to the Lord Jesus this morning for the perhaps for the very first time as your Savior from your sin? You can do that. Start your journey home, and if we've done that, we will look to him as the companion, the protector on the journey. He says to us, remember, end of of Matthew, I am with you always. What are you facing this week in life? What is that thing? That as I was talking, you focus on you don't have and that could easily eat you up. It is eating you up. What is that thing? And also, what is it that you find really hard about this present life? Hear me. He is with you in it. It's it's as we start every day, let's say in effect, rise up, O Lord. May your enemies be scattered. I need you to fight with me. I can't travel this journey on my own. May we say with the old hymn writer, guide me, O thou great Redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. 
Hold me with thy powerful hand. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are good and you do good. Teach us your statutes. Whate'er my God ordains is right. Help us, Father, to submit to your providence and your sovereignty. We thank you that as we travel our lives on this earth, on this broken world because of sin, because of our sin, we can say to ourselves and we can say to you, I know that you are with us, O God, and I know that we are not home yet. I thank you, O God, one day that this earth will be renewed. Yes, as we pass away and we go to be with you, absent from the body, present with the Lord, one day heaven is going to come back here, it says at the end of Revelation. And so we look forward to that day of a new heavens and a new earth. And we say, in effect, oh Lord Jesus, come. Rise up, O Lord. In these days, may your enemies be scattered. We need you to fight with us because we cannot journey on our own. Sustain us for the fight. Help us to focus on the Lord Jesus. And it's in his name we pray on all God's people said, amen. I'd like to invite Pastor Manasseh to come up and lead us at the Lord's table this morning.